gold and silver, the cheapest assets in the world, maybe as cheap certainly relative to other assets as they've ever been in history, and they're going to explode. Are you tired of overpaying for your gold, silver, and platinum bullion coins and bars? Then visit sdbullion.com today. SD Bullion was recently named the 177th fastest growing company in the United States by Inc. Magazine. This is because they offer the absolute lowest prices in the industry and follow up with over the top customer service. So what are you waiting for? Go to sdbullion.com today and join more than 60,000 happy investors that save money on every precious metals purchase they make. Hey everyone, this is Elijah Johnson with your SD Weekly Metals and Market Wrap. And with us today is James Anderson from SD Bullion, our co-host, and also Bill Murphy from the Gold Antitrust Action Committee and La Metropole Cafe. James and Bill, thank you so much for joining us today. Good to be here, EJ. Thank you. All right, now uh, this week with the precious metal markets, we saw gold and silver get hit hard. And we also saw, it's been a, just a crazy week, Bitcoin broke above 10,000 and soared as high as 10,700 today on Friday, December 1st, 2017. And the CME group is saying that now they're going to offer Bitcoin futures later this month. And also just this week, the Dow broke above 2,400. Everything's going crazy and it seems like all these markets are going up and up except for gold and silver. What is your perspective on the precious metals this week? I guess we can start with Bill. Well, it's totally demoralizing, quite frankly. You've got, as you said, six or seven year bear markets in gold and silver. The Dow has gone nuts. Other assets, art, real estate, all going up. You can make money in anything but in gold and silver. And uh, then you have the added insult to injuries, to it, and God bless it for the guys making all the money. Good for them. You get Bitcoin, you know, you know, going over ten thousand. Well, I mean, it's a horror show, quite frankly. And I think it's all going to change in the time to come. But it is what it is, and we have to deal with it. And I think gold and silver, the cheapest assets in the world, maybe as cheap, certainly relative to other assets as they've ever been in history. And they're going to explode, but it's taking a long time, and uh, a lot of people are quitting. You've got capitulation all over the place because they, quote, they can't take it anymore. But those that hang in there, it's going to really pay off, and it's going to be uh, epic moves. And the good thing, and I'll finish up about a Bitcoin move, is that's the way gold and silver can trade in the future, and so what? Uh, they've already done it. Yeah, I just added that. I I was commenting about Bitcoin's you know meteoric rise in the last, I mean this year especially, it's just been tremendous. And uh, just commenting with people you know in the office this week, it's it's good you know actually in a way. Uh, essentially, it's psychologically preparing the case for ten thousand dollar an ounce gold eventually. And you know, I mean, look if you ask the average person in the world, you know. Would they rather have an ounce of gold in their hand or a Bitcoin? Uh, my, my hunch is that the majority would just go with the tangible ounce of gold. It just it has a longer track record, right? Bitcoin's been around for nine years. Obviously has a lot of upside probably still, you know, it'll probably go higher. Um, but it could go down very quickly too if something goes wrong. Um, you know, there's currently, what, 1,330 cryptocurrencies out there and they keep generating more. Eventually, you know, a lot of them will, will go to zero. And uh, the question is, will Bitcoin eventually go that way as well? I, you know, no one knows. But I personally think that the psychological level of 10,000, the fact that Bitcoin has reached that, makes it a much easier path for gold to get to there uh, eventually when, when I believe that central banks will have to revalue and rejigger the system. Definitely. And do you have any uh, comments on that, Bill? Yeah, well, I agree with James, and I think, uh, of course, where Goddard comes from is uh, with all the money that's put in the system and all these other assets moving, it just shows how powerful the gold cartel is, the bullion banks, and various governments led by the U.S. and the Bank for International Settlements, and they've gone all out to make sure that 
uh, you know, gold's looked at as a barometer of U.S. financial market health and inflation and other things. And when gold goes way up, people always say, oh, something's wrong. I mean, it's common. That's what what it's known for. So they've kept it under control to disguise what's going on here. And it's worked. And they've gone all out. And so, uh, you know, we've got this incredible bear market in the sense of where we were in 2011, while other assets have soared. And as I mentioned earlier, it's going to be rectified in big time, but hanging in there is proving to be a, a tough ride for a lot of people. Definitely. And I know um, your colleague Chris Powell recently did this presentation where he um, detailed a lot about the gold manipulation, and he mentioned how GATA consultant Robert Lamborn really studied the gold activity for the Bank of International Set Settlements, the bank that you were just referring to. Um, and it's interesting, he was saying that the um, gold swaps over the last year and a half have exploded from about zero to 570 tons as of last month. What is your perspective on that? Well, Robert's a sharp guy, and it just means this is what occurs at times when the central banks or this gold cartel, as I talk about it, bullion banks want to put gold physical supply into the market. They exchange it with other other people, and the other people sell. It's a way of of uh, getting physical supply in there to hold the price down. So, uh, you know, Robert knows what he's talking about. Does a lot did a lot of work on that. So. It's just the kind of thing that we report on in various ways and means uh, all the time, and that's why we're struggling where we are today. The price of gold is just about exactly the same where it was when President uh, Trump was elected. Yeah, and just a, just another point on President Trump being elected. I mean, obviously, that was the, still the highest volume gold trading to date, so uh, it was very um, it's just suspect the way the price action worked. It, essentially, gold exploded 50 bucks an ounce overnight as you want, and then shot down, you know, 100 bucks you know, roughly in the next 24 hours. So, I mean, it looked like pure intervention when you look on the chart. Um, and then, as far as the BIS intervening and such in the gold market, I mean, the, the other thing that I find interesting is the BIS has a pseudo secondary group working out of their. Um, out of their office is called the Financial Stability Board. It, for short, it's FSB. And the FSB in 2014 got the G20 to sign off on some supranational law that essentially allows bank bail-ins um, throughout the biggest 20 nations uh, in the country, in the world. And so it, it basically ring fenced the banking system. So if there is another crisis in the future, um, that those with derivative bets are the first in line creditors, essentially. So it, it basically makes creditors, people who have checking accounts, savings accounts, and banks, you know, basically they're just loaning that currency to the banks and they are unsecured. And so if there are down the line some type of issues with the banking system, there may be haircuts taken like Cyprus. And, you know, the Financial Stability Board, as innocuous as it sounds, it literally work out of the Bank for International Settlement building. So, I mean, it's, it's, they wouldn't be simply creating these laws just for fun, right? I mean, it, it, there's some, there's, there's more going on than most people probably think. Do you see that as a possibility, Bill? Yeah, well, James obviously knows what he's talking about. And the thing that many in our camp have talked about, the incredible amount of derivatives that have come into play over the past number of years, and they're just growing and growing and growing. And there's no telling what could happen if, if something occurs that is unexpected. It's happened throughout history, and when you get a, like a nuclear reaction in these derivatives, that could set off things like this and cause things that right now are unimaginable because of what's been created by the positive market action and assets outside of uh, gold and silver. So it's you know it's coming but the timing of course is is very difficult to uh predict and, and understand definitely and one of the things i'd also like to discuss today is about uh, getting back to bitcoin and how the cme is going to offer bitcoin futures later this month a lot of people were saying that that's the reason you know that an announcement made uh bitcoin today just 
skyrocket, you know, above 10,000 and uh, to 10,700 at its peak. So what do you think, um, how do you think Bitcoin futures could change the way, um, change the Bitcoin market, Bill? Well, an interesting question. Some people think that uh, uh, the government's behind this thing. It's a way to take interest away from gold and silver. It certainly has worked <laughs> incredibly. And that contrary to people might think, uh, there's some very thoughtful people think that they might jerk it up first and get everybody going long and then just knock the wind out of it like crazy and take it into oblivion, you know, once once the people finally get sucked in for the last hurrah. I don't know if that's uh, true or not, but as I mentioned earlier, I think, and James is right, it paves the way for what gold and, can do and silver, and you can now say, well, geez, big deal. So what if gold goes up uh, $1,000 in a day? I mean, Bitcoin's doing it. Why can't gold do it? But it all has to do with the gold cartel, gold cartel and either losing control or giving up control or the physical markets completely overpowering the bad guys, as, as I call them, because of, of what, you know, of the value in gold and silver and the world, you know, flocking into them and, and the physical markets. Now, we're, it hasn't happened yet, but uh, I think it's coming. Yeah, and just to reiterate on the gold on the on the futures market, I mean Peter Brandt, who I'm not sure if you're aware who he is, Bill, but he, I mean, as far as futures trading, he's been doing it since the mid '70s, I believe, and he's he's pretty right. famous. Yeah, pretty famous amongst traders, and he's gotten um, on Twitter this past year or so and, and done some work with uh, Real Vision as well. Um, the guys down in Cayman Islands. And he has uh, just sent a tweet out talking about how the gold futures market is the tail that wags the dog, you know, physical gold. And he basically says the same thing is going to happen with Bitcoin futures market, which, you know, the Bitcoin futures market will be the tail that wags the dog, essentially, is what he's saying. So, I mean, it's just a heads up for those that are very long, you know, Bitcoin, that, that the futures market will, will have probably a lot to say with what the price action becomes. So, Bill, did you want to uh, maybe wrap up for our viewers where you see gold and silver heading for the rest of the year? It seems like right now it doesn't look very promising, but I know I just interviewed David Morgan and he sees, you know, the next three to six months pretty good because gold and silver seem to be making a higher low than they did in 2015. So it seems like we're still in an uptrend. Well, at the moment, you've got a dichotomy, a big divergence. You've got gold holding today exactly where it needed to and hold at 1270 and around the 1280 area. And technically, it still looks pretty good. And there's a lot of pressure and, and building in the market, and that's holding. Silver is, is trading totally differently. It's in a waterfall. It's the worst acting market I think I've ever seen. And it has been acting pitifully for the past many months, and now the result of all that, they've been able to take it down, and they're going after the spec longs. The open interest is still historically at very high levels, and we keep looking for an end game, and it doesn't happen. And I'm with David, but, you know, honestly, very much, I've been looking for silver once it takes out 21 to trade like a Bitcoin, but, but heck, we can't even get above 1750. So, uh, at some point, this game's going to end and be absolutely spectacular. But boy, oh boy, uh, silver right now, it's, uh, it's looking like it wants to take on a 15 handle. And it's going to change, but we didn't see it this week, that's for sure. Yeah, and just to add to that, the, uh, you know, gold's showing obviously a lot of strength today, I mean, versus compared to silver. And, and I, I would assume in the next half year coming up, that'll be probably the case. Gold is probably gonna outperform silver like it typically does when it starts to go back up. <clears throat> and I would expect, obviously, as we go further down in, into a mania phase, silver will obviously outperform gold, but it doesn't surprise to see you know gold stronger than silver. It just seems like the longs in the futures market tend to, tend to scatter uh, when there's raids like this. All right, and getting back to something that Bill was talking about when he was talking about Bitcoin, how it seems like a lot of the interest in something alternative to fiat currencies, you know, um, that's going into Bitcoin, if I heard you right, Bill. 
What is your perspective on that, James? Well, I mean, if you look at Bitcoin right now, I think the total market capitalization is around 170 billion. So it's still a pittance compared to, you know, a eight trillion that uh, gold bullion in the physical world is worth. Uh, um, so, you know, let's keep it in perspective, I suppose. The, the other thing, I mean, silver, if you look at the physical supply of silver, it, what, 60 billion roughly? I mean, there's maybe three, three billion ounces of investment grade form, 3.5 billion out there. So, I mean, it's, it's interesting that Bitcoin's total market cap is already almost three times the size of silver's. But in comparison to gold in the physical world, it's, it's still a fraction. Uh, but yes, I, I, I agree in the fact that there is a lot of hot money chasing Bitcoin right now. And, you know, that hot money could obviously chase physical gold or silver if people understood the fundamentals of the facts. But uh, I, I, I do believe that that'll, that'll work its way out in time. Um, and like I said earlier on in the conversation here that it is, it is psychologically, I think, paving the way for, for what <clears throat> I think Bill and I, and um, maybe you as well, Elijah, believe in the, in, the, in the cards in the future. Hey, one, one question I wanted to throw at Bill. Uh, Bill, I, I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware, but it looks like Goldman Sachs put a, a bid out for Scotia Makata, uh, their bullion yeah, desk. And uh, Scotia Makata, I think, is trying to, they've been trying to sell that for like a year now i think they they're trying to get jp morgan to help them and uh i just want to get your thoughts on what you think i mean there's a few other bidders i think um a few other banks besides goldman sachs who are bidding for it but what do you think about it and you know what just any any ideas of what may be going on there well the highlight of course is the, is the trouble of getting rid of it they've got all these legal issues as you may know which supports goddess case about the, all the different kinds of rigging and the gold and silver markets, and then they've got some potential, you know, big lawsuits. So I'm sure that's the big issue behind the scenes, how, it, how that can be dealt with and what goes on there. But um, it's interesting, and, uh, you know, <laughs> from my experience, anytime Goldman Sachs gets involved in our world, it's not good. Uh, it's, it's never a positive, and maybe that is all going to change one day, but I know it all started way back when with Robert Rubin, and he's the first one that started leasing gold, I believe, way back when he was in charge of uh, Aaron in in, uh, in London, and he was, you know, and got that going. So we'll see, but um, um, it's 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 a great question, and and we'll see how it plays out, and and uh, hopefully it'll be a positive one for a change. Yeah, I mean, I I got to assume this derivatives. Um you know, hologram that we've been living under for the last few decades, uh, at some point it's going to have to change. And those who kind of have an inkling of it, at least the commercial banks who are smartest, may go long in some form or fashion. I mean, right now you have J.P. Morgan, who's, you know, transparent comics holdings are, well, you know, it's a pretty good amount. It's, um, like, it's like 120 million ounces sitting in their comics warehouse. Not saying that all of that. I think, James, it's like four or 500. Oh, really? Yeah, that's right. According to, you know, Ted Butler, who's, who's commenting that not only the comics warehouse, but also all, all the bullion they've siphoned out of SLB because they have a trustee there. No one knows what number that is. And then, you know, he asserts, I'm not sure, but he asserts that they've also been buying government-issued coins even as well. And so... Um, I could definitely, I could definitely agree with them on the Comex and the SLV siphoning. That's been going on for you know over six years now, um, ever since 2011. Ever since you know the bear if, if I might ask, get your thought on it, James. It, it's just been the most bearish thing we've seen in the market. If it's visible, is J.P. Morgan buying physical silver? You're yeah. right. That's exactly the extent of the bear market. Yeah, exactly. I mean, essentially, once we hit 50 in the spring of 2011, they, they went into the market and started just buying up. And you look at that chart, it literally is just going up, um, you know, on a 75 degree angle. It's it's straight up to 120 million. And that's the transparent holdings. I'm not saying they own it outright. They may be holding it for a few other people as well. But the fact that they're also using SLV, I think, as a siphon is 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 fairly interesting, and I don't think anyone really knows exactly how much they've siphoned out of there. I'm sure Ted Butler has ventured to guess, and probably over hundreds of millions of ounces there as well. Well, this was my uh, 
thinking I've talked to John Emery about it quite a bit and also in my commentary that, you know, when the silver market took off, the open interest on COMEX was 135000 all the way up. Now it's 190, 195, and last year it got up to 235. So my notion, I mean, I'm glad you said that in the sense of my thing was, how did Morgan get all the silver? Well, they started buying it, like you said, but they, they, at the top they began selling the derivatives, the futures markets like crazy, and buying puts and selling in the over-the-counter market. So they were massively short, but they were they were acquiring physical silver at the same time. Right. They're chasing away the people who might push the price higher, scaring them with pure power derivatives, and then uh, acquiring the physical on the cheap at the side, right? They've just been doing that for, what, six, yeah, seven well, years? And, and that, if I'm correct, and it may not be, that they were probably net short two, three, four, five times in terms of the amount of derivatives, and, and we're building enough physical market, and, and now... Uh, as the markets come down, if the market ever needs any physical supply to get the price down, they can supply it. So do you think the reason that they're, you know, holding so much physical silver is to, as you're saying, manipulate the price down if it has to rise again? Or do you think they want to rise, uh, uh, ride the price back up if silver does skyrocket in the future? Well, nobody knows. All I know is what we've had so far, and J.P. Morgan has been the main culprit, and their agents have worked together with the United States government and the rest of the gold cartel, and they're on the sell side uh, with their allies until the plug is pulled, and there's no sign of it yet. You know, people like myself and you know think when silver takes out 21, it should shoot towards 100, but boy, that seems every time I talk like that, we get killed. All right. Well, James Anderson and Bill Murphy, thank you so much for joining us today. Before we let you go, did you want to share with the viewers where they can find you and any last thoughts you'd like to add? Yeah, thanks for doing the interview. And uh, my colleague, Chris Powell, just on his way back from London, did a great job over there spreading the word. And he can be, people can sign up with him at uh, www.gata.org. And I've been doing my thing for about 20 years at LeMetropoleCafe.com. People can sign up for a two-week free trial. and This is really a tough time, and we are going to – those people that hang in there are going to make a lot of money, and they just got to get through this uh, difficult period. Any last thoughts, James? Yeah, I mean, we're in the, the peak of the bear trap, it feels like. I mean, you got people who have been, you know – long gold and silver and, and, and talking about how great an investment it's, it is and the potentiality of where it can go. Who are now trade you know changing their colors and they're essentially now pro cryptocurrencies and now they scoff at gold and silver. And to me that's healthy. You know, that actually is a good thing. That kind of confirms the fact that we're nearing the, the bottom of this whole this whole event and that we'll, we'll probably start climbing up in the next years to come. So, you know, it's, it's just a question of you bought gold and silver probably for fun, fundamental reasons. And all you have to do is simply go back and look at the fundamental reasons for why you purchased in the first place. And my hunch is if you <clears throat> did the analysis when you bought versus the analysis today, um, nothing has changed. And in fact, you, you have more reason likely not.